Stefano. Um, I am really excited and a little nervous. Um, I don't know why I'm nervous, because y'all are so sexy. Um, uh, to talk about my work, uh, which is The Body Is Not An Apology. But before we do that, I'm going to ask everyone to stand up again. I want you to take your hands and rub them together. Make some heat, some heat, some heat, some, some, some heat. And then I want you to put those warm hands on your heart. And I want you to feel that beating heart inside your chest, the thing that has you be able to be here right now with us, right? And then with consent from your partner, <laughs> from this person beside you, I want you to ask, can I touch you? <laughs> in, 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 the, in the most appropriate conference center kind of way. Yeah. And just put your, I just want you to put, I know you'll be tempted to do things like embrace, which is beautiful, but I just want you to put your hand on that person in some way. Just put that warm hand on that person. And notice that they're here too. Guess what? And guess what you all have in common? That body, that vessel that you have to do this journey in, right? That thing that we so often stop thinking about um, because we treat it like our head is not part of our body and then we treat it like we just live here in between these little spaces right here, right? But the reality is that these conversations that we're talking about are about whether or not we can live harmoniously, compassionately, sustainably in these beings, these vessels, because that's the only way to do this particular ride on this particular rock is in these vessels. And so what we're really saying is, can I be responsible for your body? Can I share in the responsibility of the care of your body on this planet? And if we are not doing that, then we're not really doing the work. So thank each other for being allowed to touch each other's bodies. <laughs> So I run The Body Is Not An Apology, and The Body Is Not An Apology is a digital media and education company committed to cultivating radical self-love as the foundational tool for social justice and global transformation. Quite simply, we cannot change the world without a foundation of love. And I want to complicate the conversation of love because I think we have it in very flat ways. I love you. That's so cute. <laughs> but if I can't feel that love, if that love doesn't show up as action in the world, then it means nothing. Oh. It's empty. I don't need you to tell me you love me if that doesn't come with some doing, right? <laughs> um, and so I'm talking, when I talk about radical self-love, I'm talking about an action kind of love. The body is not an apology. Our mission is that we believe that discrimination, social inequality, injustice, I swear I got rid of all this weird highlights. If you notice, this is not my skill set, PowerPoints. So if one of you visual storytellers want to help a sister out, do it. Um, I got you. I need a new, whole new deck. Um, we believe that discrimination, social inequality, and injustice are in many ways about our inability to make peace with the body our own bodies and other people's bodies. And through information dissemination, um, radical education, and community building, we foster radical, unapologetic self-love, which we believe translates into radical human love in action and service toward a more just, equitable, and compassionate world. Right? In action. The kind of love that does some shit. Right? So, the way that that looks in a very practical world is if you go to www.thebodyisnotanapology.com, you will encounter our online magazine. Our online magazine takes these issues. We use the vehicle of the body because it's the one thing we all have in common. It's the one thing we all have is that we have to be in a body to do this journey, right? And so we talk about what does it look like to look at global issues through the lens of the body, which actually gives us the opportunity to not leave anybody behind, right? So if I asked you right now to look around this room and say whose body isn't in the room, but we don't think about other people's bodies. And part of the reason we don't think about other people's bodies is because we don't think about our own. 
is because we are in a fractured relationship with our own bodies, which means that we have no choice but to be in fractured relationships with the bodies of others. And so the work is about transforming our relationships with our own bodies because it gives us access to transformed relationships with the bodies of other human beings. So when you go to our website, you can read about the intersections of these ideas through the lens of weight, through the lens of disability, through the lens of sexuality and gender and age and race and parenting and men and global society and intersections, all of those things. And we talk about practical things like how not to say fucked up shit to your depressed friend, <laughs> right? <laughs> Really, like, really practical ways, right, to be in relationship with other people's bodies. How to de-indoctrinate ourselves from the messages that we have received and internalized about bodies. Six ways I was taught to be a good fatty and how I stopped, right? Because we, and part of it is that we view these issues as interpersonal, not recognizing that the systems and structures of the world are built on our ideas about bodies. I want you to just take a moment for folks who saw Anote's arc last night and imagine if climate change were sinking Martha's Vineyard. Imagine people just shouting into the wind, everyone and all of the wealthy white people in Martha's Vineyard are dying and no one did anything. <laughs> you can't imagine it because we would never allow it to happen. And we would never allow it to happen because we value those bodies and we don't value those bodies. Oh. And so this is about transforming whose bodies we value and divesting from systems of body value or body hierarchy. We are not an organization about self-esteem and self-confidence and body image and body positivity. Those are great. I love those. It's important. I want you to feel good about yourself. Great. However, those things don't change the world. Because they're about your own individual experience, right? And I want you to have a good individual experience, but your individual experience will not transform the collective unless you're intentional about the collective, right? And so I'm not interested in self-esteem because self-esteem is wavering, it's fluctuating, and it's usually just about you. And I'm talking about an interdependence in our relationships with our bodies that gives us access to a just and equitable and compassionate world. I need you to change because right now you're in the way of my radical self-love journey. Your un, uninterrogated um, racism, your uninterrogated ableism, your uninterrogated homophobia is in the way of my ability to live radical self-love. So I need you to get it together, <laughs> right? The impact on bodies, I swear I fixed all this shit, damn it. <laughs> oh, I'm so mad. Really, really quickly, and I, I can read it, so I'll just read it from here. Um, the UNICEF report found New Zealand's youth suicide rate of teenagers between 15 and 19 to be the highest of a long list of 41 OECD and EU countries. The rate uh, of 15.6 suicides per 100,000 people is twice as high as the U.S. rate and almost five times as high as Britain. There's a reason kids in New Zealand are killing themselves. Right? And part of it is because of the stigma that we have about mental illness, which is about the body, right? It's about the stigma that we've built in. It's about the lack of resources. It's about um, growing up in a culture where it's inappropriate to be fully expressive. Right? These are things we can see the real life impacts of in our societies. In the US, young men aged 15 to 19, um, a study between young men aged 15 to 19 found that black people in this age group are 21 times more likely to be killed by the police. That's about a story that we've told about black boys' bodies. Right? Um, of the 102 transgender murders in the US between 2013 and 2017, 86% of the victims were black, Hispanic, or Native American. That's about the stories that we tell about trans people of color's bodies. So that's what I do, right? That's the work I'm up to in the world, is transforming how we relate to our own bodies and how we relate to the bodies of others so that we can transform the systems and structures of society that allocate resource, that provide shelter, that provide money, that provide opportunities, that provide safetyness and well-being, right? 
Um, and that starts with you transforming you, right? And so here's what I've been doing this year, and I'm going to try to say shit fast. All right. I slept a lot. I, like, really got my rest on because rest is, rest is revolutionary, like, for real. <laughs> and I slept on this island. That's where I live. I live on Waiheke Island. Isn't it awesome? You should come visit me. I have two extra bedrooms and a deck overlooking the water, and I make great coffee and macaroni and cheese. <laughs> but also, I did some cool shit this year. One of the first things I did was I partnered with K. Marie Dunn of my cohort, get out, Kawa Kawa, um, to have a conversation with young Maori leadership around governance. And I talked about entrepreneurship and the combination of entrepreneurship and social justice. That was amazing. Um, I did a workshop talking about the relationship of language and bullying um, at the uh, Erenui Marai uh, with young boys between the ages of 12 and 15. It was adorable. Those are the babies. They're so cute. Um, I built a really powerful relationship with Tutamu Wahini Otaranake, where I've had the opportunity. Um, Naropi is on the right, and she is brilliant. This organization is run. She founded it, and her daughters um, all keep it afloat, dealing with interpersonal violence and family wellness um, amongst Maori uh, in Taranaki, in the Taranaki region. I've had opportunities to do awesome workshops with them, to work with um, both offenders and survivors of domestic violence, um, uh, community corridors, it's been dope. Anyhow, Seven Sharp came and covered my 10 Tools to Radical Self-Love workshop, which is really cool. Um, it's probably the first time anybody on Seven Sharp said, did you hear the one about the fat black bald woman? <laughs> it's how happened. then this, Sonia would be the one to tell it, which is the appropriate response. Um, so anyway, if you go to my website, you can see that video. I released two books this year. That's a lot of books in one year. In February, I released The Body is Not an Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love, which is the how do I take these ideas home and learn? How do I practice this in my everyday life? And how does this everyday action serve to dismantle systems of oppression in the world? Um, that's what the book does. Uh, is Anne-Marie in here? Anne-Marie came up to me and she was like, I read the book! Oh my God! Uh, and I was like, I'm so glad you like it. Uh, and w at some point, we're going to have a session together talking about how do you take these ideas and apply them very directly to your large global scale projects. How do we, how do we take these ideas and move them from concept to praxis, right? Uh, I went on a 79-day book tour. Don't ever do that. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. It was terrible. Um, it was amazing. It was great for book sales. It was brutal on my body. People send me pictures of their, the second book is Celebrate Your Body and It's Changes to a Body Positive Guide, the ultimate guide to puberty. Uh, and so it's for your eight to 12 year old cisgendered girls for the most part, unfortunately. I wanted to be a little bit more expansive, but publishers, blah. Anyway, but I do think it is an important and amazing um, book that prepares you for your body in a way that can make you excited about the changes of your body, right? What would happen if we did not have the stories of shame that we inherited when we were seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old? What would be possible if we could erase that in the world? Right? That's the goal of that book. Um, this, I had to include it because it's, it, it was like somebody wrote the review that I meant. I was like, oh, you got why I wrote the book. So I'm going to read it to y'all. This book merits the invention of a new category, intersectional systemic self-help. <laughs> it would be easy to assume that Taylor's book is about learning it to love your body. Her goal is much bigger than that, though. She is trying to get us to love and appreciate all bodies in a body terroristic society. When reading this, I couldn't help but comparing it to Ta-Nehisi Coates. I was like, all right then. <laughs> Meditations on the black male body and in between the world and me. Taylor's work is far deeper. It is an intersectional treaty on all bodies in the ways that society teaches us to judge, critique, shame, subjugate, and control various bodies. Taylor's take on fat shaming, racism, heterosexism, ableism, and more. She makes connections between the personal and the systemic. Her writing is insightful, well-informed, and highly accessible. I was like, she got it! She got it. Cool. Um, I've also been busy in Aotearoa as well. Uh, 
I did work at the Auckland Writers Festival. I did a whole bunch of stuff at the Word um, Word Festival in Christchurch. Um, I had a chance to uh, do book events with Black Lives Matter Vancouver. I was the commencement speaker for Smith School's College of Social Work Master's and uh, Doctoral Program. I'm on the WOMAD uh, lineup this year for the festival, so come see me. And I also got to do the launch with Parliament and Jacinda two weeks ago. I went to Bosnia to talk about the intersection of arts and activism in post-war societies. Um, they put me on some covers of some shit, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but what's next? This is the thing I'm most excited to talk about and then I'm getting out of here, I'm sorry. So anyway, I'm co-editing a book right now called The International Handbook on Fat Studies. It's an academic um, in partnership with Kat Pauze, who is out of Massey University here. Um, I'm working on a workbook to accompany The Body Is Not an Apology's Radical Self Love so you can start practicing it. I'm working on a memoir. Um, right now I'm trying to figure out how to make this website monetized. I need somebody to help me figure out how to make money. I know y'all can do that. You all got, some of y'all got that. So come holler at your girl if you want to figure out how to make me make money. Um, workshops, performances, a lot of diversity and equity initiatives with companies who are interested in using radical self-love. If you want to transform your company's culture, if you look around your boardroom and it looks like you, you're not doing it right. If your boards are a bunch of old, able-bodied white men, you aren't changing the world. If, you're, if the leadership in your organizations all look the same, you're not changing the world. And so let's talk about how we redistribute power in a way that's equitable and actually creates the, the conditions we say we want. This is my biggest thing right now. This is the thing I'm most excited about. Um, I thought of it the other day in bed when I was in deep depression, the willing to risk challenge. Part of the reason the world won't change is because we won't risk shit. Because we're afraid to be uncomfortable because we have, uh, we have premiumed comfort over justice. And there are small everyday ways that we get the opportunity to interrupt comfort in service of justice. And one of the conversations, one of the things that happened to me that made me think of this the other day, I was at a porch on Waiheke Island with the folks who sometimes keep my dog. We have a very regular conversation and they were talking about a friend, they were sort of easing into some body shaming conversation about a friend who'd had lots of plastic surgery. Um, and then one of the women threw in this very sort of transphobic comment. And it was a moment that I've seen a thousand times over where someone says something that absolutely is oppressive to someone, to some group somewhere. But we don't want to interrupt. We don't want to mess up the vibe. We don't want to disrupt comfort, and so consequently, we allow oppression to stand. And I had a moment, I had an opportunity in that moment, I said, Sonia, you can either be about what you say you're about, or you can be about comfort in this nice little batch on the beach this afternoon. And I realized that I didn't have to destroy the whole day to say something. I just simply said, I have some really amazing trans friends. They're really powerful and important in the world. Um, and that's who I know trans people to be. And that person, in that moment, had enough to know that there was something that wasn't appropriate, right? That was it. I didn't have to do more. And we went right on and carried on with our conversation. And I helped them dismantle why body shaming their other friend was whatever. <laughs> But in that moment, I got to be an advocate because I was willing to risk the comfort of that moment for the purpose of equity and justice. I'm interested in launching this campaign all over the world. I'm interested in making willing to risk challenges that go viral everywhere where people interrupt everyday acts of oppression with the choice to get us uncomfortable and get us free. Let me know if you want to work with me. Kia ora.